good evening. Um, thank you for that very warm uh, welcome. Uh, really, it's always very humbling to be in Colombo. Uh, the quality of intellectual conversation uh, I get here uh, is uh, truly remarkable. Um, and it's wonderful to see some old friends, uh, Minister uh, Harshadi Silva and uh, kind of my partner in most mischief in Colombo, Rohan Samarjeeva uh, and Sujata, uh, but um, also nice to meet a lot of new people. Um, I was assigned the task of talking about socioeconomic rights, and I'm not going to give a full lecture. I think what, what we hope to do this evening is actually generate a conversation. So we want to uh, uh, spend as much time uh, having a panel discussion and sort of, you know, uh, uh, inviting responses from the audience. So my lecture will be brief. It's not a full lecture. Think of it more as preliminary remarks to a panel discussion. Uh, uh, in which the minister will also be involved. The brief I was given was to talk about this question, should socioeconomic rights be incorporated uh, in the Constitution? And I realize this is a subject of live uh, and passionate debate in Sri Lanka uh, uh, in terms of kind of the making, uh, you know, revising the Sri Lankan Constitution. And I want to assure you at the outset that I'm not going to talk directly about the Sri Lankan constitution, uh, little debates. Uh, two reasons. A, I'm not equipped to do so. I think, I think they involve a intricacy that uh, I certainly do not possess. But B, and most importantly, and this is a preliminary point I want to begin with, that when thinking about constitutions, the first and most important thing to remember, and this I'm speaking as somebody who's worked on comparative constitutionalism, uh, we've just done a big handbook on the Indian Constitution, that a constitution is a social contract amongst a particular set of, um, you know, within a particular group of people, right? And because it is a social contract, it has to reflect the historical specificity of those that people, their values, goals, aspirations, identities. There isn't a thing like a cookie cutter, cutter template. Um, I was joking with Rohan before this um, meeting that you know one of the things I think that saved India was the fact that you did not have an army of constitutional consultants in 1948 suggesting best case solutions for everything from federalism to you know separation of powers and human rights. Constitutions are social contracts. And part of what it means to be a social contract is that they need to be legitimate in the eyes of the people who are going to be governed by that constitution, right? And in that sense, a, po a constitution and the choices you make about a constitution is fundamentally a political negotiation. Always be very suspicious of anybody who tells you that there is such a thing called, uh, you know, like, as I said, a, a first best constitution, a conception of constitutional validity that's independent of the legitimacy that that constitution exercises over its people. So it's, it's up to you know, your elected representatives, the people of Sri Lanka, to in a sense negotiate their way into a settlement. And the, and, and, and the test of an enduring constitution, right, is, is a very simple one. Are all those people who are governed by that constitution, do they feel this is a constitution they would have chosen if they were exercising their rights as free and equal citizens, right? And it's not, it shouldn't be up to experts uh, or people will call constitutional authority to actually come and prescribe an ideal form of a constitution. What we can do is a little bit is share, right? What different constitutional experiences look like and what those experiences might mean for how you think about, right, your own positions, um, uh, uh, as it were, on the Constitution, right? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the mandate. Now, what I'm going to do very briefly in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is talk a little bit about how should we frame the debates over economic and social rights in the Constitution, right? Uh, then talk a little bit about the Indian case and a couple of possible lessons for Sri Lanka or, or any other constitutional um, uh, uh, making process, and then end with perhaps a couple of suggestions uh, 
um, about things to think about um, in, 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 in the Sri Lankan debate. Uh, okay. Now, historically, the way the debate over socio and economic rights in the Constitution has been framed, there have been three prominent framings on this question, should socioeconomic rights be constitutionalized? Right? The first framing was a kind of teleological framing. Right? So this is, this is a standard textbook constitutional history that everybody is taught. First generation constitutions like the American constitutions are concerned with civil, civil liberties, rights, and so forth, negative liberties, right? Freedom of expression, representative government, right? But as the ambit of social, social citizenship expands, we add more and more rights to a common basic core of civil and political rights, right? And this expansion of the language of rights is very much reflected in rights discourse around the world. It's reflected in international human rights governance. You have economic and social rights as part of UN Declaration of Human Rights. The later a constitution is written, right? So South Africa being the most prominent example, but Kenya and so forth, the more likely it is to actually contain social and economic rights. So one framing of the question of social and economic rights is, this is part of some natural progressive teleology of improvements in constitutional making. The first set of constitutions were concerned with tyranny, so they emphasize liberty. Later constitutions come to realize that you actually cannot emphasize liberty without capturing at least some form of substantive equality. And that's why this growing trend towards greater constitutionalization of economic and social rights, right? So this is a natural teleology, you can't escape it. That's, that's a kind of historian's tracing. There's a philosopher's tracing of this, which is often a little bit skeptical of the idea of sort of constitutionalizing economic and social rights. It's a little bit skeptical because traditionally philosophers have made distinctions between what we might call civil and political rights, right? And economic and social rights, largely on account of the content and character of the rights. So the basic intuition, I mean, I won't rehearse these arguments, but the basic intuition is socioeconomic rights are harder to constitutionalize because they're a lot more polycentric. You know, so you might say you have a right to health, but it's not clear what a right to health would amount to, right? It's not clear how you would make it justiciable, right? So even if you agree with the principle, right, institutionalizing or realizing that right involves a much more complicated set of considerations than saying protecting freedom of speech, right? Where basically the court order itself provides you protection and instantiation of that right. That's a very conventional distinction. That's how kind of philosophers have sort of framed it. And the third framing uh, is what you might call the more ideological framing of the story. Uh, the ideological framing goes something like this, which is economic and social rights are often thought to, to define the difference between left and right, right? So we think of the right as, I'm using the right in the sense of the economic right, as a bit more skeptical of social and economic rights, because social and economic rights on this view typically enhance state power, right? Uh, it licenses the state to intervene, right? In order to produce much more substantive equality, right? So these are the, you know, and, and a lot of heat and passion is generated around these debates. What I want to submit to you uh, very briefly is that I think all three of these are the wrong way of posing the question, right? To my mind, and you know, we did some empirical work also on the instantiation of social and economic rights. The proper question to ask is the following. What is the problem that constitutionalization of social and economic rights is meant to solve, right? I think the ideological divisions around, const on, around social and economic rights can sometimes be exaggerated. I think it's fair to say in the 21st century, any state, has to meet a certain basic legitimation demand. And part of that basic legitimation demand
will have to be the provision of opportunities for economic empowerment, rights to health, education, maintenance of the environment, and so forth, right? I mean, I, I mean it, it's hard to imagine any 21st century state that does not have to meet these objectives, right? As part of instantiating their own legitimacy. The question, however, is, are those goals met by putting socio and economic rights in the Constitution, right? So we all agree, and, and this is an important point to begin with, we could all agree that it is good to have the best health care for all citizens equi as equitably as possible. Nobody disagrees with the right to, dis or with the need to disseminate education as widely as possible. Very few people would also disagree that you need some sensible labor regulation, workplace regulation, so forth, right? And there's a whole series of things, right? The specific question is, are you more likely to achieve those ob objectives if you actually constitutionalize them, if you put them as part of the Constitution rather than leaving it to the normal hurly-burly of representative politics, right? That's the core question. Yeah? Now, the short answer to this question, if you look at comparative empirical evidence, turns out to be the very boring answer that most social sciences gives, give to every question, which is, depends, right? Which is, under what conditions? And usually, the answer throws up a paradox which is, it is precisely those countries, right, that would have achieved these goals, health, education, environment, and so forth, even in the absence of constitutionalized social rights, that also do better when you constitutionalize them, right? What do I mean by this? This is a very important point. In countries like India, and I think it's probably true of Sri Lanka, it's probably true of almost all developing countries, South Africa certainly, Kenya. Part of the fascination with constitutionalizing more and more rights comes from a feeling of deep state failure, right? Uh, most countries that have achieved a lot of these rights, right, social democracies of, of Scandinavia, advanced developed countries, actually did them without constitutionalizing these rights, right? So the idea that constitutionalizing a right is a necessary condition for achieving a particular goal is simply a false idea, right? We have a fascination for constitutionalizing it because we think in the absence of making it a justiciable constitutional right, our legislators, our ministers, our members of parliament will not actually create the conditions for its realization. So this context is actually very important because the discourse of rights in developing countries, right, emerges out of a history of state failure, right? We want to go to courts because legislators will not give us these things. That's the, that's the master narrative as it were, right? Now here's the paradox. If you are a, in a country where the legislators do not give you these things as part of the normal give and take of representative politics, it is highly unlikely that even if you constitutionalize them and make them justiciable, right, you will actually have the effective institutions get, that can deliver these rights in the first place, right? right? So the idea that rights can be a substitute for broad-scale governance reform, that idea, I think, needs to be challenged frontally and squarely. And it's a mistake, you know, I think, I, think, I think one of the interesting things in constitutional law is in India, if you did a poll, right, amongst academics particularly, of those who favor constitutionalizing rights and those who don't, typically lawyers love constitutionalizing rights. They want more and more rights written into the constitutions. Economists and political scientists are a lot more skeptical, right? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm overgeneralizing a bit, right? In part because, right, as I said, economists and political scientists are very concerned about the consequences of these rights. 
So remember, if you think, and I'm just putting this as a summary proposition, if you think that constitutionalizing rights is going to be a substitute for solving the governance problem, right? Solving the, the problem of the fact that your legislator is not de delivering, right? Then I think you're in for a root shock. And this is largely what the comparative evidence is actually sort of telling us. And, and I'll just briefly kind of talk about the Indian example and then uh, talk about one or two um, others. So India is a very interesting case in the debate over constitutionalizing economic and social rights. As most of you know, in the Indian constitution when it was promulgated in 1950, we did not constitutionalize economic and social rights. We had something called directive principles of state policy. And it's worth asking the question why India did not constitutionalize them in 1950, why they were made, left as directive principles of state policy. Um, Ambedkar, the architect of the Indian constitution, in his earlier work was very much for a more expansive constitutionalization of these rights. But when it came to the constituent assembly, he changed his position. Now some argue because he had to politically compromise. But I think there were two intuitions behind his change of position that I think are very instructive for any debate on this question. He basically argued that the question of economic and social rights needs to be framed institutionally rather than philosophically and ideologically. What did he mean by that? He meant two things by that. First, if you are constitutionalizing social and economic rights and you are making them justiciable, you are implicitly trusting courts to deliver on those rights more than you are trusting legislatures. Right? And the question to ask is, is that trust justified? Or rather, under what conditions is that trust justified? Why do we think we should tr trust judges more than we actually trust our politicians? Right? And this question is actually not an easy question to answer. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons lawyers love socioeconomic rights, why middle classes love socioeconomic rights, by the way, right, is because we think somehow judges, right, as a class, as a, in virtue of their institutional location, will be insulated from politics, right? And because they're insulated from politics, they can deliver those things we want delivered. Ambedkar was, on the whole, a little bit skeptical of that idea. I mean, he's not saying judges are bad, judges can't be trusted, right? But the idea that in any society you can trust, or, or, or let's put it this way, if a society reaches a point, right, that it feels it needs to repose more trust in judges than it does in its politicians, then you probably have a deeper corrosion of democracy anyway. Okay, you're in much bigger trouble, right? The second reason he changed his mind a little bit was his basic argument was that, look, in any society, there is a deep difference of opinion on economic matters, right? In our constituent assembly, you had communists, you had socialists, you had free market liber you know, liberals, right? Capitalists, people who wanted strong property rights protection. And Ambedkar's basic argument was that a constitution should not prejudge many of these choices. We could all agree that having more healthcare is a good idea. Having more education is a good idea, right? Having greater work, workers' welfare is a good idea. But we might disagree on the institutional architecture that's going to produce that outcome, right? And his worry was that deep entrenchment of these rights in a constitutional structure abridges that democratic and political discussion. That what that best solution is should ultimately emerge out of democratic politics, number one. Number two, it should be open to iterative re-examination, right? So we sometimes strengthen property rights. It doesn't work. Global economic circumstances change. You know, we might have to change our stance. Or just to take a controversial example, people these days talk about the fact that 
let's say one of the rights that's discussed a lot, right, is uh, workplace protection for workers. No, I, I, I don't mean just in terms of safety and so forth, but in terms of you know, increasing the workers' bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis employers, right? Now, we could all as a society agree that increasing workers' power vis-a-vis -vis employers is a good thing. Let's say we agree on that. We could actually still disagree on what would best achieve that outcome. If your economic analysis says, for example, as is currently the debate, that employment elasticity of capital is falling, right? Joblessness is a, jobless growth is a problem everywhere in the world. And therefore, you will need a form of social protection that detaches income from employment, right? The debate, let's say, over giving everybody a basic income. You might actually come to a different view of what the employer-employee relationship should be. Your argument might be giving people a basic income actually enhances their bargaining power, like India did with the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. That's a better way of doing it than right, putting stringent minimum wage restrictions and placing the onus upon the employer. Right? There are two different models of enhancing workers' bargaining power. Now, how do you decide which is correct? And Ambedkar's basic point was, look, this is something that needs to be amenable to iterative learning, right? The challenge, the danger of constitutionalizing is, right, that you may be constitutionalizing on premises that actually, you know, shift very fast because economies change and so forth, right? And my view, judging by the Indian experience, is that I think this, this way of thinking, Right? Two questions, as I said. Are courts going to be you know, better guarantors of those rights than legislators? And the second question, is the nature of this problem such that it should be open to quick iterative learning in a democracy rather than right, be, as it were, fixed in stone by a set of constitutional principles? That was the reason we India ended up with director principles of state policy. Right? Now, the subsequent history of Indian legislation is kind of interesting. Um, and, and again, an interesting lesson for Sri Lanka and, and other constituencies. So India ends up with the following paradox. We put up right to property in the constitution right, in 1950. We did not constitutionalize social and economic rights. By the 1990s, the reverse had happened, which is the Supreme Court, using its powers in the way that Ambedkar feared it might, started reading all these rights into the Indian Constitution. So the Supreme Court basically took Article 21, which says we have a right to life. It says right to life cannot simply mean right to bear subsistence. And through the right to life, began to read almost every right into the Constitution. So it promulgated a right to shelter, right to health, right to education, right to environment. We even have a right to sleep, by the way. There's a, there's a famous Supreme Court judgment about being sleep undisturbed, right? So it read a whole series of rights into the Constitution. On the right to property, something interesting happened. India weakened the right to property because it was thought to be a weapon that could be used to protect the privileges of the rich. So you wanted to weaken the right to property to enable redistribution of property, land reform, and so forth. But you know, looking back the last 70 years, this is the biggest paradox that happened, which is weakening the right of, to property allowed the state to dispossess the poor much more easily than they dispossess the rich, right? The state used its power of eminent domain you know, not just for infrastructure projects, but for helping all kinds of private developers, right? In socio and economic rights, and, and this is the last point I'll make about the Indian Constitution, the Supreme Court has pronounced a whole series of rights. And the question to ask is, has Indian governance improved as a result of the promulgation of those rights? Right? Now, this is a complicated empirical question. But my short answer would be very little. So here's the paradox. The court pronounced the right to education, 
we now have a right to education bill as a result. But this right to education bill was passed the day India's enrollment in primary education had already reached 100%. So the right came after the fact. But more importantly, the right focuses largely on the input side of education, right? So you must have a school of so many square feet, et cetera. It has absolutely no bearing on learning outcomes. In fact, India's learning outcomes have worsened after that right was pronounced, right? Uh, similarly, right to environment. Ask yourself the question, how does India, with the most progressive environmental laws in the world, end up with the filthiest air and the dirtiest water in the world? Right? Right, uh, right to health. To be fair, I think the Supreme Court's intervention certainly puts a little bit of pressure on the executive to answer for administrative lapses. But the constitutionalization of that right has not led to the creation of a better public health system. Right? In short, what I'm saying right, is that the very governance pathologies that prevented us from doing well on these economic and social rights, those very governance pathologies right, are reproduced when the courts administer those rights. Right? Partly because Beyond a point, the courts don't have the power right, to actually have these rights enforced. And, 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 and one of the interesting things I want to submit to you is if you look at the contemporary moment in the constitutionalized right, we are facing another paradox, what John Gardner calls the paradox of legality versus juridification. What he means by this is society is becoming more and more juridified. Right? We are bringing more and more things under the rubric of justiciable rights, right? Yet, the domain of illegality is increasing, right? And part of the reason is, and this is a feature of social and economic rights, that you can promulgate these rights, but the courts do not, and beyond a point, do not have the power to design appropriate remedies. So just to give one example, the court announced in India a magnificent right to livelihood and right to shelter, right? The most famous case in the constitutionalization of economic and social rights in kind of, you know, if you read global textbooks, Olga Tellis versus Bombay Municipal Corporation. Great rhetoric, announcement of this right, it's now recognized as a constitutionalized right. What was the remedy the court provide? How can the court provide these remedies? Right? If you look at the remedy section of the right, it's well, adopt some due process. Before you evict people, give them six weeks notice instead of four weeks notice. And mind you, in certain contexts, that can mean a lot. I don't want to belittle those processual claims. Right? But the crucial point is right, that in social and economic rights, globally what you'll find, South Africa has always presented as this magnificent example. Right? the most progressive social rights constitution, the gap between the rights and the remedies courts are prescribing actually grows. Right? And so you have this paradox that as a citizen thing, you think you're entitled to a right, but it is a subversion of the rule of law to say, I have this right, but I don't know what remedy is going to be attached to it. Okay. So I'm just going to sort of conclude briefly with a couple of sort of thoughts. So, in some, what I'm saying, I mean, this is, this is the point, which is that empirically, and we can talk about the Brazil case perhaps in discussion, uh, empirically there is very little evidence to suggest that constitutionalizing social and, political, uh, social and economic rights makes a huge difference to governance, right? If it does, it sort of does so at the margins. Uh, it does, right? It does have expressive value, uh, it can sometimes allow the courts to hold the executive to account on procedural issues, and we can see how uh, different courts kind of do it in different contexts. But if you believe that constitutionalizing is going to, as I said, compensate for those governance deficits, and one of the reasons why we like constitutionalizing rights is because this is governance on the cheap. Right? All you have to do is put an article in the Constitution. Right? 
All the lawyers will declare victory, the left will be happy, civil society will be happy, because there's this great focal point. What happens after that? Right? That, I think, remains, in a sense, a big and unresolved question. Now, I was reading the Sri Lankan sort of select committee report on you know, rights. It's a wonderful document. And one of the things I like about it is it's great emphasis on rights that need to be protected, which our courts aren't in India, uh, uh, as well as globally, right to privacy and so on and so forth, right? But one thing that sort of struck me, I think, and, and this is my last thought kind of based on comparative experience. I think it's inevitable that there will be some form of social and economic rights in any 21st century constitutions. I think, I think as I said, you know, the, the momentum in that direction is, is very high. My only recommendation for consideration would be the following, which is that if, if any constitution does end up putting a social and economic right in the constitution, it should at the same time provide a clear legislative framework to put underneath it, right? So just to take one example, let us say you do have a right to health, right? Now what does a right to health entail, right? Uh, the, you know, the, the, the European drafting on this, ESHCR, is very interesting. It says, everyone has the right to preventive health care and the right to benefit from medical treatment under conditions established by nat national law and practices, right? It's a conditional right, right? Now, what you need to do is specify what these national law and practices are. Otherwise, and this is the last example I'll end with, you might end up with the paradox Brazil ended up with. Brazil is one country where the right to health cases are the most litigated. Right? I mean, it's a truly astonishing number of cases, right? So courts are very active, you know, tens of thousands of cases a year. Every study is finding out now that the right to the promulgation of the right to health ended up benefiting the privileged more than it ended up benefiting the poor. Why? Because it's an unspecified right to health, right? You can show up in court and say, look, you know, I need an expensive dialysis machine, right, I, given the disease I have, right? And if a court is dealing with the case individually, right, it can use the right to life, right to health as a basis to actually grant you that relief, right? But that relief comes at a cost, right? So unless a right, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's workers' welfare, it's not just important that the right be an open-ended right in the Constitution. It should really carefully put underneath it a legislative framework that specifies what those national law and priorities are. Because otherwise, right, you risk having the worst of Ambedkar's of nightmare, which is the economy governed by courts, power taken out away from the legislature and democratic process, right? And a perverse outcome that that right can be used more to, as it were, buttress the rights of the privileged than to protect the weak and the vulnerable, which is what that right is meant for. I'll stop there and, you know, sorry I've gone on a little longer and we can have a discussion.